Okay. Welcome everyone to the Yamhill County formal um, Board of Commissioners formal session. <laughs> um, it's May, May 9th, oh my gosh, May 9th of 2024. And it is 1026. We apologize for the delay. We've been in executive session this morning. So thank you for your patience. And Commissioner Starrett, would you please lead us in the flag salute? Okay, anything to add to the calendar session or for the calendar session? No, okay. Did we wanna talk about um, a potential work session now or do you wanna make wait for next week? Just to get it on the books? I'd get it on the books for next week. Yeah. Is that too soon, though? What do we have next week? week? So you'd like to the work session for discussing facilities. Um, my first question for scheduling: uh, Is there interest um, in having representatives from Sarah Architects who helped put together that the original plan? join us as well to maybe talk about the updates and that'd be great and because we could do a primer and i i just want to be able to check their availability okay. and, so let's not set it yet then let's uh get with them and see where we're at but we could tentatively maybe two weeks okay um but uh and uh -huh. we i could come back and give an update next week that'd be on great. how soon we could get something scheduled and we could have them available available yep that works for me okay mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything through the month of May. So it looks pretty open. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so item D is public comment. This time period is reserved for public comment on any topic other than an agenda item, a quasi judicial land use matter or a topic scheduled for a public hearing. So if you're in the audience for anything other than an agenda item or the public hearing later, or if you're online, please raise your virtual hand if you would like to give public testimony. Okay, seeing and hearing none, we will move on to department updates. There's nothing today. Nothing on work session, nothing on consent today, nothing under old business. And that brings us to other business, I-1. Consideration of approval of service element prior authorization number 94241157 under the agreement between Yamhill County and the Oregon Department of Human Services, board order 23-367 for the financing of community developmental disability services in the amount of $118,067, <clears throat> period. Sorry, <laughs> that was the end. Um, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Any questions? None. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Aye, all opposed, same side. Motion passes, thank you. I too. Consideration of approval of the lease agreement between Yamhill County and Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic, doing business as Women, Infants, and Children Nutrition Program, or WIC, in the amount of $1,576.66 per month, retroactive to October 24th of 2023 through October 23rd of 2025. Chair, this is uh, the WIC program over at our public health building, and they are leasing a portion of that. They'll continue to lease a portion of that, but they're also planning on moving into the Kirby Street location. So when that is ready, we'll have an entirely different lease and we'll negotiate that to replace this one. So I would move approval. And that's coming pretty soon, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, any questions? None. None. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. 
Motion passes, thank you. I three, consideration of approval of amendment number seven to agreement number 180033 between Yamhill County and the Oregon Health Authority for Public Health Services, Board Order 23-260, removing $23,914 in funding for fiscal year ending June of 2024. Chair, this funding was awarded for inadvertently for fiscal year 2024, so this is a correction to that, so I would move approval. So I had a question on that. What does that mean to inadvertently award funding? Well, I wouldn't maybe use the word inadvertently. That was the word that was used in the memo. But basically, if this was awarded for one fiscal year and for the fiscal year ending 2024, this is removing that funding for that fiscal year. So it's at this point having to correct that. Did I miss anything? So we shouldn't have received it, basically? Correct. We have to send it back. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Okay. Did did I did you move approval? Yep. I did. You do. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. I four. <clears throat> Consideration of approval of amendment number one to agreement number zero two six zero two eight between Yamho County Health and Human Service Services and the Oregon Health Authority, or OHA, Board Order 24-29, removing funding in the amount of $290,261.27, retroactive to January 1st of 2024 through June 30th of 2025. So this basically addresses our aid and assist population, and this is funding that, again, another correction to our base funding for that. So it was decreasing from 524,189.99 to 233.98.72, and it's already been included in the HHS budget. Is this standard? I mean, we we just mm -hmm. went through budget week and, and the reduction for HHS was 600,000. This is almost $300,000 of a calculation correction. That's yeah. a lot of money. So Director Manfred could probably provide more details than I can, but I, I do know that this is something that we navigate with all of our various agreements with state agencies because they're on a biennial. And so a lot of times those funds get planned, we build budgets, you know, and then when you start getting near the end of the biennium, we see these adjustments. Sometimes it's additional funding that might be available. Other times it was, you know, cleaning up some of the, mm -hmm. the contract language as such. So um, it, okay. this was accounted for um, within the HHS budget for the current fiscal year and was also factored in for building FY25 as well. So. If there's if there's more questions about the specific impacts on what this could be, I could see if uh, Director Manfred's available um, or could come back and, and advise or make a report on that. And also when you have these service elements and it's like this is the mental mental health. Uh, it's it's a mental health um, fund, then. Um, if there's any change to that, we're seeing that in the next amendment, where if you have a change to. When it, for instance, the legislature has required different, uh, different actions on the part. In other words, um, they've added something that the county has to do, which is to check on um, young people who have had any kind of contact with any of the mobile crisis services. So that's going to be changed. So it's pretty much moving on a regular basis where the funding is provided. If there's a change in any of those service elements, then that is withdrawn or moved to a different fiscal year. So uh, okay. we've, I've just seen that pretty much on a number of occasions throughout the year. I think that's significant for the public to know that HHS specifically has these pretty wide swings of yes. corrections where they're reducing almost $300,000 from one budget and maybe rolling it over, maybe not, maybe we're cutting a check back to the state or the feds, but um, I think that's an important uh, context to have, especially in the discussions that we've had in the past two weeks. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay, did you move approval? I did. You did, okay. Any further questions? None. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Great, motion passes, thank you. 
I-5, consideration of approval of amendment number two to agreement number 026-028 between Yamho County Health and Human Services and the Oregon Health Authority, board order 24-29, adding funding in the amount of $10,000 for mobile crisis retroactive to January 1st, 2024 through June 30th of 2025. So basically this is adding funding because there are new requirements for the stabilization services for children and their families. Any families, any children, anyone under the age of 20 who has uh, been in, uh, engaged with crisis, mobile crisis services, there is a follow-up required now with the, with the youth and with the family. So this is just adding funding to address that. And um, anybody who's not been in enrolled in services as a result of that initial contact with crisis services, there's more of a push to get them to engage um, if they haven't decided to do that. Okay. Do I move approval? Okay, any further questions? None. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Um, item I-6, consideration to authorize Brandon Battle to sign the ODOT DUII Deputy Grant ENF-AL-24-14-16-00 between Yamhill County and the Oregon Department of Transportation retroactive to April 1st, 2024 through September 30th of 2024 in the amount of $140,000. And uh, we've talked about this last week. We talked about it this morning. This is for a dedicated DUII traffic um, safety enforcement deputy and just continuing that work that we've done. Mm -hmm. So I will move approval. Are there further questions? None. None. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Thank you. I seven is Consideration of approval of intergovernmental grant agreement number G259-25-044 between Yamhill County and the State of Oregon slash Department of Public Safety Standards and Training for Crisis Intervention Training, CIT, in the amount of $1,500 effective upon full execution through June 30th of 2025. I will move approval. Are there any questions or discussions? None. None. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Great. Motion passes. I think that brings us through other business. And uh, next up, we have our public hearing. So let us just adjust here for a second. All right. Okay, I will go ahead and open up the public hearing and call for abstentions by any members of the board. No. None. None? Are there any objections to the jurisdiction of this board to hear the matter before it? Okay. Does any board member need to announce and state on the record the substance of any ex parte contact or site visits? Nope. Okay. And now we will have our uh, planning director, Ken Friday, read the statements required by law. Oregon law requires that persons who attend a land use hearing be advised of certain rights and duties before the hearing begins. First, with regard to standards for approval, state law requires that we list the applicable substantive criteria that must be met in order for the county to approve the application. The standards will be listed by a county planner in a moment as part of the staff report. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed towards the standards for approval. Second, the raise it or waive it rule. 
Under Oregon law, any issue that might be raised in an appeal of the county's decision in this matter must be raised before the record of this hearing is closed. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision makers and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the board based on that issue. Third, and this is directed to the applicant, under ORS 187.796, failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval, again, with sufficient specificity to allow the county to respond to the issue, precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Finally, I will note that under Oregon law, and because this is the initial evidentiary hearing on this matter, any participant, that is anyone who submits oral or written testimony during this hearing, may, before the record of the hearing is closed, request an opportunity to present additional evidence, arguments, or testimony regarding the application. The request must be made prior to the time the chair announces that the hearing is closed. Thank you. And my apologies, I forgot to open up the docket. So we are talking about docket number M-02-24 slash SDR-02-24. A site design review for the construction and operation of a new wireless communications facility consisting of a 125 foot monopole tower with associated equipment cabinets, emergency diesel generator and cabling. The applicant is Mike Unger. Uh, I believe it says representative for ACOM consulting for Verizon Wireless. And this is tax lot 4408-00201. Okay. And now we will go to the staff report. Thank you. The subject parcel is located within the exclusive farm use EF80 zone with an address of 3375 Northwest West Side Road, McMinnville. In 2001, the parcel was created due to a partition docket P1101. The parcel is 82.7 acres in size. On-site uses include a commercial farm, a dwelling and other outbuildings. Zoning to the north, west, and southwest of the subject parcel is exclusive farm use EF80. Parcels to the east are very low density residential, VLDR 2.5 zone. Parcels to the south and southeast are within the city of McMinnville. Property sizes varies from 1.3 acres to 249 acres. Directly to the east of the subject property is a community garden, 12 tax lot zone VLDR 2.5. There are homes on each tax lot except one. To the south is a nature preserve and an 88 unit apartment complex. Baker Creek runs through the southeast section of the property. A portion of the parcel is within the floodplain overlay zone and there's no other overlays identified. The request is for a site design review for the construction and operation of a new wireless communication facility, including a 125 foot monopole and associated equipment cabinets generating cabling. The request must satisfy sections 40202F 110102 of the Yamhill County Zoning Ordinance and ORS 215.275. Okay. <clears throat> and it looks like we have the applicant's case next. Welcome. If you could state your name and address for the record. Thank you, Chair Bershauer. Commissioners, uh, for the record, my name is Mike Connors. I'm with the law firm Hathaway Larson. Address is 1125 Northwest Cooch Street, uh, Suite 550, Portland, Oregon, 97209. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the applicants, uh, Verizon Wireless and uh, Harmony Towers. Uh, with me here as well is Sarah Blanchard from ACOM, who's a consultant on this, and then Brian Mullen with Harmony uh, Towers is uh, participating via virtual. Um, I'm going to handle the bulk of our testimony, including questions, but if you do have questions that I'm not as familiar with as the consultants that have a little bit more of the detail, I may uh, refer to them. Um, as staff indicated, uh, the proposal before you is a 125-foot monopole wireless communication tower on property zoned EF80. Uh, the facility is necessary to address a significant coverage and capacity gap in the north and west ends of McMinnville and the surrounding county area. Um, and I think you 
this morning received a letter from at least one person, Mr. Anderson, that had corroborated the fact that there's difficult coverage out in this particular area. Um, prior to filing for this particular site, um, the applicants went through a, a very extensive site selection process. Uh, in this case, it took about a year and a half. And I always try to say that because some people sort of assume that carriers just, that's where we want to be and that's where you go. And that's not really how it works. There's this pretty extensive process. And the way that process works is initially we work with our uh, uh, radio frequency or RF engineers to determine what's the location that you need for a new facility to deal with this coverage and capacity gap because it's locationally dependent. And they create what's called a search ring. It's an area of property that they determine a tower facility can be located within that that could satisfy uh, the particular needs, you know, depending on the height. And in this case, it produces a search ring and then the consultants go out and start looking at potential candidates. And the first thing that we always look at is co-location. Um, it's, it's almost always the cheapest and most efficient from a regulatory perspective to find an existing tower or a structure that we can co-locate on. It's, it's to our benefit in large part. Uh, but unfortunately in this area, there are no existing towers uh, anywhere uh, in the search ring or near it. And the structures in that area are not tall enough to provide a sufficient height to be able to achieve the objectives. So once that, uh, per, that first option was ruled out, the second option was to look at properties uh, that are more commercial, uh, you know, zone that, uh, that would be more uh, consistent with this kind of facility. Um, and so uh, a lot of the properties uh, were in the city of McMinnville, but one of the problems is, is that the city of McMinnville has adopted pretty restrictive zoning and so, at least with respect to wireless communication facilities. So their zoning code basically prohibits any kind of new tower anywhere except for industrial zone properties. And so looking at the city of McMinnville, uh, the area within the search ring, there were no industrial property zone properties. There were a couple of properties uh, that we did look at, uh, although they were outside of the uh, search ring, just to make sure uh, that did have zoning that could accommodate the Organic Valley Creamery and uh, the U.S. Bakery property. Uh, but those are ruled out because either the property owners weren't interested in having a facility on their property or uh, there wasn't space for the tower. Uh, it wouldn't be able to achieve the objectives. So then the next step into that is really looking at the available properties, and that's how we landed on this particular property uh, because it is a property within the search ring, it does provide us uh, the ability to achieve our coverage and capacity objectives. Uh, we have a property owner who is interested in leasing space to us uh, for the tower, and that's why we proceeded with this particular candidate. And in picking the particular site, it's kind of a balancing act because really it's up to the property owner. They're the ones that are leasing the property, and this being an active farm, uh, the property owners wanted to make sure that they didn't, imp that the, any impacts on their farm operation were minimized. And so that was one of the factors in terminating the site. And then there was also a particular location where there's a barn, some trees. Uh, granted, it's not gonna provide full coverage. Uh, neighbors are still gonna be able to see the tower, but it will provide some visual mitigation. And so the site that we selected was really a balance of, predominantly the property owner saying, this is the area that will have the least impact on my farm operation. Uh, and then also having some adjoining structures and, and trees that will provide some visual mit mitigation. Um, so we submitted the application, we went through the process, and as you know, your staff reviewed it based on the standards, determined that it complies with all the standards and approved it. Uh, and then uh, we have the appeal, which is why we're before you here today. Um, so the appeal that was filed <clears throat> challenges the planning director's approval on two grounds. And then there were some, some additional neighbors, and in particular, uh, the Norrises who submitted another letter that raised some additional issues. And uh, we provided some written responses to both the appeal as well as uh, the letter from the Norrises. I uh, just want to confirm those are in the, in the records. Uh, uh, April 29th letter uh, from myself, as well as a May 8th letter uh, that addressed the Norris's letter. And what I'm going to try to do is just kind of summarize uh, our response to the appeal issues. And then uh, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to, to ask along the way. Um, before I 
address the specific issues that have been raised on the appeal. I want to uh, kind of address an overarching issue related to the state and federal law that applies on this application, uh, because it is somewhat unique and it does impose restrictions on the county's review, the scope of review, uh, because this particular property is zoned EF80. Um, and it's both at the state level as well as at the federal level. Um, so starting with the state uh, uh, level, this facility uh, qualifies as a utility facility necessary for public service and is a permitted use in the EF80 zone. And this is one of those unusual land use situations where typically the state kind of sets the bare minimum and counties and cities can add whatever restrictions they want to. But in the EFU or EF80 zone, that's largely dictated by state law. State law sort of establishes both, both, both the floor and the ceiling of what regulations can apply. And in this case, um, there's a particular statute, ORS 215-275, that provides the approval criteria for a wireless facility on EF80 zones. And the statute itself, as well as the case laws interpreting the statute, basically preclude local governments from imposing additional restrictions beyond that. So really, the, the basic standards that we have are the standards that are set forth in that statute, 215, 275. And then there's also the federal component. Uh, there's the uh, Federal Telecommunications Act. Um, and that's a federal law that applies all wireless uh, kind of applications uh, you know, around the country. Um, it doesn't contain specific criteria. It really contains sort of restrictions on what local governments can do. And the idea is that wireless network is a, is a national infrastructure. Uh, we need to have uniform standards. Those uniform standards have been established you know, through all these public proceedings that go on. And that the federal law is ensuring that local jurisdictions and states don't adopt you know, varying, very widely different standards that will make it impossible for carriers to be able to meet because they're looking for a uniform standard. That's kind of the purpose behind the Federal Telecommunications Act. There's one particular provision in, that applies here that I'll get to when I address those particular issues, but that just gives you an idea of sort of the federal and state overlay that apply for this kind of an application. So now I'll turn to the uh, appeal issues. So as I indicated, the appellants raised two issues. I'll address those first, and then I'll go to the other issues that were raised. Um, the first issue that was raised is a uh, concern from one of the neighbors about uh, the uh, impact of the facility on the views to the properties on the east side of West Side Street. Um, and while we understand there's always a concern about visual impacts, unfortunately, it's not really possible to, to design these in a way that avoid some kind of visual impact because height is, is key. Um, but really, um, it's not relevant to the approval criterion on that basis. We think the uh, board should reject that argument. Um, and really what it goes down to is, I, as I indicated earlier, the statewide standards are in ORS 215, 275. Visual impacts are not one of those standards that apply. So that's not a standard that can be used as a basis for reviewing or denying application. Now, with that being said, we always understand that our facilities are going to have impacts on neighbors. So we try to do what we can based on the circumstances to try to mitigate those. And in this case, as I indicated earlier, we've tried to locate this in part close to the barn, existing barn that's on the property. There's a large tree by it. There's also some trees uh, along the street uh, on West Side Road that will provide some visual mitigation. Um, and then we also have around the base of the tower, it will be fenced in, there'll be uh, uh, slats in it so that the equipment itself won't be very visible. Uh, and so again, even though we're not required, we're mindful of that. We made some efforts in selecting this site to be able to put in a location that would mitigate some of those visual impacts. Um, the second issue that was raised on appeals really related to the first, uh, or maybe not, but at any rate, it's a concern about potential impacts on property uh, values. Um, and there's two reasons why that property value impact issue is not relevant to this particular application. Uh, the first one is, again, there's state law, that statute or S215, 275 doesn't include uh, uh, impacts on property values as one of the criteria that you consider. Uh, but secondly, there's also a line of LUBA cases that state that even for wireless facilities that aren't on EFU 80 zone or in any other zone where the state law isn't sort of the regulatory standard, uh, LUBA has determined that 
a in order for property uh, impact uh, property value impacts to be relevant to the criteria, it needs to be set forth expressly in the code. And your code doesn't include that kind of criteria. So it's not relevant under the state law. Uh, it's not relevant under the county code. So on that basis, we don't think that that's a legitimate basis to overturn the uh, planning director's decision. Um, so now I'll move on to the issues that were raised in the Norris's letter uh, and kind of give you some brief uh, responses on that. Uh, the first issue is that uh, the Norris has uh, raised the issue that this wireless communication facility will displace some agricultural land on the subject property. Um, even if true, uh, again, this is a permitted use. It's a permitted use in the EF-80 zone. So the mere fact that it may be displacing agricultural land is not a basis to deny. It's not a requirement that there be no displacement whatsoever. Um, but um, as I indicated earlier, the site was selected in coordination with the property owner to minimize the impact on, on the farm operation. A particular area that was selected is an area that, as even the Norris has noted in their letter, that that is not being actively farmed uh, where our site will be. Um, and so that's part of the factor. But the other big factor that people may not understand is that wherever we put our facility, we're going to need to build an access drive to it to make sure that we can access it with, with a vehicle and make sure that we can run utilities to it. So the fur further that area is from where the road is, uh, the longer that access driveway is going to be. And that's going to take out all farm property uh, in order to facilitate that kind of an access drive. So that was what was behind this site and its location in closer proximity um, to, uh, to the road. Um, that kind of gets to the second issue that the Norris has raised was they were asking about, uh, you know, uh, can they relocate it further to the West? Um, and we understand where that comment is coming from, um, but we're kind of hamstrung. Uh, we're hamstrung in part by a property owner who's actively farming the property and that has determined this is a location that's going to have the least impact. And this is what uh, we think, uh, where we think it should go to minimize any impact, any impact on the farm operation. And, um, <clears throat> You know, under both the state and county code, there's no specific requirement that we relocate on another piece of property in order to mitigate impacts or because someone asked us. That's just to, just to set the table that there's no requirement. But the bigger problem we have here is there's actually a standard that prohibits us from doing, I think, what the neighbors would prefer that we do. And that is that there is a standard in the statute, 215-2755, that basically says an applicant should mitigate to the extent possible impacts on any farming operation. And that includes the subject property where the facility is going. And so for us to be able to move it further from the West, and again, if we're going to do that, we're not talking like 10 feet, 20 feet, you know, in order for it to have any kind of actual significant impact to the neighbors, it have to be pretty far. That would be a extensive uh, access road. Uh, as I indicated earlier, to, to be able to have drive access to the facility, to be able to run utilities. It would also be in an area of the, of the property that's being actively farmed. And under the state standard, I think that would violate it because I think now that we have a location that clearly is designed to mitigate impacts on the farm uh, operation, moving it in an area that would significantly increase those impacts, I think violates that standard. Um, and that's, you know, it's part of the frustration. We're not the ones that make the rules up, but the state statutes are primarily designed to try to minimize impacts to the farming operation. They're more focused on that than impacts on the surrounding area. And that's kind of the standard that we're stuck with. And, you know, as well as counties, you know, the Amel County and other counties, because that's the state law. But that's the reason why uh, we can't relocate it further to the West and why we pick the specific location that we pick. Um, the next point that was raised was uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Norris or the Norris's uh, claim that there's a potential violation of the Federal Telecommunications Act because uh, this is not the least intrusive use for the community. And, you know, that is language that appears in the act in some uh, cases, but, but I think there's a misunderstanding about how, how, that, uh, how that law applies because the Federal Telecommunication Act it doesn't contain specific requirements for an applicant. It doesn't say all applicants must find the least intrusive means. What it does is it imposes restrictions on local governments. And so there's a series of restrictions. And one of those relates to the least 
impactful uh, kind of use. So it's not something that is a standard. It's not something that we're required to meet. It's really a restriction that if the local government is trying to deny an application, the Federal Telecommunication Act says, well, if it's the least intrusive means, you, you, you're prohibited from denying it. That's really where that standard comes up. I don't think it's really relevant in this case, uh, because again, this is dictated predominantly by state law and meeting those state standards. Um, but again, as I indicated, although you know we're not required to do the most least intrusive, we did do what we could based on the circumstances we have to try to mitigate the impacts by, by uh, proposing it in the location that we did. Um, the next issue that was raised, uh, and it's the last issue I'll address, at least from the Norris's uh, letter, is there were two issues that they raised related to the RF, radio frequency emissions. First one is concern about health impacts to the property owners in the, in the surrounding area. And the second one was uh, health or environmental impacts to bees, because uh, they're, you know, uh, bees and part of the, part of the agricultural um, um, process here, you know, they play a role in that. Um, and, you know, this is always the hardest one because I understand where people are coming from, but this is where the Federal Telecommunications Act comes in because it expressly prohibits state or local governments from basing a decision for a wireless communication facility on any health or environmental related claims due to RF emissions. And I say that that's a hard one to deal with because I know for a lot of people that's top of mind. That's what, what they're really concerned about. They get very frustrated the lawyer standing up saying federal law prohibits you from, from, from considering that. I mean, it is what federal law is, but just so you understand the reasoning behind it, um, I always like to provide that at least for those people that it may give them a little bit less frustration is the idea is again, you know, these wireless communication facilities, it's a national infrastructure. You have to have these uniform standards. And so they go through a very extensive process uh, seeking out comments, scientists, research, different, you know, uh, public policy groups on different sides of the perspective to provide all their input, data, and science behind it. And then they go through this extensive public uh, process, and then they determine based on that, what are the acceptable RF emissions? So it's a very science-based, extensive, broad public process. And the idea behind the Federal Communications Act is this is very technical, scientific, detailed information. We need to make sure we not only have a uniform standard, but we need to make sure in local proceedings where you may not have the experts, you may not have the different perspectives, and then having them decide these RF related emissions issues kind of on an ad hoc basis. That's the purpose behind the Federal Telecommunications Act. That's why it prohibits local governments from reviewing or denying applications on these basis. And uh, for whatever it's worth, I always like to at least explain that so people understand why that uh, rule is the way that it is. Uh, and so with that, um, that addresses all the issues that were raised in the appeal and the Norris's letter. Um, so in conclusion, um, you know, we believe that uh, the county planning director uh, applied the applicable approval criteria, correctly approved the application. Um, and we feel that the appeal is really based on a misunderstanding of what the legal standards are. Um, and based on uh, our letters and my testimony, we ask that the board reject the appeal uh, and affirm the planning director's um, uh, decision uh, because it is consistent with the county, federal, and state standards. Um, and then we also would request that if if you do decide to um, reject the appeal and approve the application, uh, that we would offer to provide some supplemental findings. Uh, in the event that you were to approve it and a party were to uh, appeal your decision to the Land Use Board of Appeals, one of the things the Land Use Board of Appeals looks for is what are what findings are there in the decision that address the issues that were raised on appeal? And if there aren't findings, then they'll automatically remand it back. And so um, in talking with Mr. Friday and planning staff, uh, we offered, and we've done this in the past, actually with Yamhill County, provide some supplemental findings for you to consider at your next hearing uh, your next meeting um, so that we have some findings that address the issues that have been raised on appeal. Um, and with that, that concludes my uh, presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Any questions at this moment in time? Thank you. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And now I will call for any testimony in support of the application. And if you're online, um, please raise your virtual hand. Okay. 
And now we have uh, the appellant's case. If there is an organized opposition or appellant uh, case to be brought forward, now is the time. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Members of the commission, uh, my name is Gary Norris. I'm here uh, on my own behalf as a property owner. I'm not representing anybody, uh, okay. either disclosed or undisclosed. I want to make that clear right up front. I'm I'm here on my own behalf. I think my wife Lynn is owners of the property at 3330 uh, Northwest West Side Road. Um, we've also submitted uh, several concurrence pages from six of the eight or so neighbors in the immediate vicinity. The opposition to this cell phone tower is uh, unanimous. I haven't uh, garnered a single comment from any neighbor that isn't strongly opposed to this. I'll I'll leave that to you. You've got the concurrence pages in the record. Um, I I won't belabor or regurgitate the remarks I made in our written submission. You've all got that in front of you. Um, aside from the credibility issues that this application creates. And, and let's keep in mind that the applicant was very specific that they would not use any agricultural land in citing the cell phone tower. And we now know that that's not true because they've admitted that they do intend to use some agricultural land and they just decided to put it next to West Side Road. Um, <clears throat> what's also now undisputed in the record is that the primary driver for placing this cell phone tower right on West Side Road, where it has maximum impact on our property and our neighbors, is from the property owner for their convenience. And I'll address that in a second. In other words, there are no technical or engineering reasons or criteria to place the cell phone tower here. It's preference of the property owner. So I'll leave you with that and um, you can consider that. Uh, I want to address Mr. Connor's uh, comments uh, real quickly, and then I'll um, stand and deliver it. We want to put the laser dot on my forehead and uh, ask questions. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I appreciate Mr. Connor's comments. Uh, he certainly knows what he's talking about, and he did a very good job. It's not testimony. A lawyer's uh, comments on the record are not testimony. And so what we have in the record uh, at this point uh, since the applicants have now rested, is what's in the written record and my comments as a landowner, just for procedural sake. And I also want to point out briefly that I have not received or had the chance to review Mr. Connor's uh, response to our letter, so I'd appreciate some reasonable period of time uh, to look at that and respond to whatever you think is appropriate. Uh, a week, two weeks, uh, not trying to draw this out any longer than it needs to be. Okay. Um, Ken, can you verify when that came in? That letter came in. No, uh, the response I just copied right here the letter. Yesterday afternoon. It was uh, yeah, yeah. yesterday. Okay. Oh, okay. So it would be in the packet. Right. But I mean late yeah. late submitted, yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't recall getting this. Um Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on when it was received, so, okay. You can give me a reasonable time, whatever you decide that is, I'd appreciate that. Okay. Uh, so, my wife and I have tried to make it clear that if this cell phone tower can be approved on a, a different part of the Bernard's 280 agriculture acre, agricultural acres, then they get no pushback from us. Uh, but the fact that it was somewhat arbitrarily placed here, uh, there just appears to be no reason for it. Now let's address Mr. Con Connor's uh, arguments that it's really not feasible uh, to put the cell phone tower anywhere else on the property. There's been no substantiation of that. Uh, there's been, uh, and if you go out to the site, uh, two or 300 yards to the west, there are large outbuildings, presumably with aprons and open areas. I mean, there's an entire site here. And if this board is going to approve uh, disabling or, or covering up a small portion of, of EFU 80 class one soil, whether it's 100 by 100 uh, 
block or a 50 by 50 block, then let's do it someplace else where it has less of an impact uh, for the reasons that I've articulated in our letter. In other words, there's no objective support for why this tower needs to be where it is. Mr. Connor also alludes generally to the fact that it's going to create additional impact on the Bernard's farm property, and I, I dispute that. First of all, there's a long straight driveway that heads due west from this barn, and it goes all the way back to an old farmhouse and these very large outbuildings that are several hundred yards to the west. So I can see no reason whatsoever why an additional access road will need to be engineered. Uh, and uh, any additional trenching or uh, expenses to lay conduit to power the cell phone, um, this is not a complicated feat of engineering. And the other important thing that I think this commission should decide, given the re very real objective impact to us and our neighbors, uh, is if cost of installation is raised as a concern to put the cell phone tower someplace else, let's put hard numbers to it. I think that we ought to be entitled uh, to a qualified scope of work prepared by the applicant, at least one, maybe two contractors bids. And I'm talking about real world contractors, licensed, bonded, insured, who will roll trucks on the project for concrete and actually do the project and revenue projections, because this is a significant capital improvement project on behalf of the companies involved where they stand to make substantial money. So if we're going to weigh if the commission gets to that point, if we're going to weigh cost of installation to see if it's too much or too much of an impact on farmland, that needs to be done in conjunction with what they expect to make off the project, because we can expect this wherever it goes to be here for 5, 10, 15 years or more. And these are for-profit corporations who did not decide to site this cell phone tower unless they thought they were going to make some money off it. So that information is also missing from the record. And I see no reason at this point why it is unreasonable or technically or from an engineering standpoint, not feasible to site the cell phone tower somewhere else. And the other thing that is notably missing from Mr. Connor's response or any evidence from the applicant is any engineering or reception reasons why the cell phone tower can't be placed on another part of the property. Nobody's come in and said, well, we, you know, we ran our equipment around and there's only one place on the whole property where this thing will have adequate reception. There's nothing in the record to substantiate that. So uh, without belaboring the point, uh, our position is uh, that in addition to the issues raised in our letter, this project is basically half-baked at this point. It needs further study. And uh, if we're going to make a decision today or uh, based on this record at this juncture, uh, I strongly urge the commission to say no, not at this point. Let's evaluate further. Let's leave the record open uh, if needed for further information and uh, further study. Mm -hmm. I think I'm done. So any questions from any members? Thank you. I have one. Um, we obviously love when we have these controversial topics come up and hear that neighbors have been at least trying to work together. <laughs> it's very helpful for us. We want to be good neighbors. Um, and it seems like you do. Um, what kind of conversations have you had with the Bernards? Has there been any discussion directly with them about, um, you know, why they chose this location or potentially another location? I, I have had no conversations with any of the Bernards on this issue. Uh, I'd be happy to continue that discussion with them or Mr. Unger or ACOM. And I think, as I mentioned in our letter, my wife and I would both be uh, more than happy to pursue some sort of a more collaborative decision-making process so that we can find an acceptable location. Uh, and, and I'm not here to rat anybody out necessarily. Uh, I, I just, this is a bad location, but we're more than welcome or more than willing uh, to uh, talk to the Bernards, talk to ACOM, uh, talk to Mr. Uh, Connor's office. Uh, we'd love to engage in that process. Okay. Yeah. And it's not always possible. So I'm not, I'm not trying Pardon? to, it's not always possible. So I'm not trying to place an, you know, unrealistic right. expectation, but I was just curious if we those conversations. We the opportunity to be part of a, uh, an intelligent discussion of a, 
a more suitable site for the cell phone tower. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Norris? No, thank you. I, excuse me. I'd just like to know, are you asking to have the record left open? That, that's what I understand. Yeah, that's what I understood. I just want to make sure you're specifically asking because it was a little... I'm, I'm not specifically asking to have the record left open necessarily. Um, I think that's up to the board. What I'm, what I'm saying is, based on the record as it exists now, I think that the decision should be no. If the commission makes the decision that you'd like further information, I'm more than happy to provide information from our end. Uh, but our position is that the, the decision here today, once this record is closed, is no with we need to come back and resubmit it if they can come up with a better location I, I just want to let you know you are entitled to ask for the record to be left open for at least seven days since this is the initial evidentiary hearing but um if you're not asking for it then well it would give you time to respond if you right so choose you, commissioner uh, i think in seven days i could respond to mr connor's letter so i would re request that would uh, would you prefer two weeks so you'd have a chance to talk to the bernards uh, and I'd want to talk to Mr. Uh, Connors about that because that'd be fine. I think that'd be good. At least we'd know more. So let's do that. Let's hold the record open for two weeks okay. and I'll attempt to uh, contact the Bernards and uh, through Mr. Connors' office, I think. Uh, and let's, let's talk about it. Tomorrow. I think that's a good idea. Okay. Uh, do we continue through public agency then still? Yeah, we would okay. continue through public agency and, and of course, I'd like uh, also, and maybe during rebuttal, Mr. Connors can okay. say whether or not uh, that would, uh, seven days or two weeks, um, if he has any objection to that, because we're, we're just required to do seven days. Okay. And uh, ultimately, it's up to the board. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Lindsay, we have one other comment. Oh, yes, I'm getting to that next. So um, so now I will call for any other testimony in opposition to the application. So you're free to come forward. Shoulders. Hello, I am Hi. Carolyn Wells Kramer and I live at 35. Carolyn Wells Kramer and I li live at 3550 Westside Road. So it's slightly up from there. And I don't have all the legal fancy stuff to tell you. I'm going to tell you, I lived there for 13 years. I have two children and it's a very dangerous road. Mm -hmm. And the crashes are right there, right at that exact location. And if you guys look it up, if you contact the police officers, we just had a major fatality right at that actual where they want to build this tower. And Every day I come home worried about my kids. The, um, the trucks come, the, um, the um, lumber cut trucks come down that road. That bridge is very narrow. That location that they want to put is right where that bridge is narrow. And if there's any facility trucks coming in and out to maintain that tower, you, then, you just have added more traffic to a location that's not a safe facility. So that has a lot of concern for me, for our safety. Um, there's a lot of residents right there who have children, who have families, you can tell I'm getting emotional about it, but um, for 13 years, I've worried about my kids crashing on that road or being hit. I've seen a death a couple blocks up from us and then some fatality that just happened this year. Um, every year, that area is called the suicide lane. And you want to put a facility that has trucks coming in and out of there, it's not residential. I mean, it's not a farming area and it's high traffic. I know that they probably look for that location because it's on the edge of the city and they couldn't put it in the city. So it was the next best thing. It was the closest to the city. Um, but we do consider ourselves as still the city. I'm five minutes to De McMinnville High School. Mm -hmm. So we are not in farmland. We are right there. We are very close to downtown. And um, so there's one thing in regards to the safety factor. The other thing is that I know the Menards hate having people stop to photograph that barn and put that tower right behind that barn will prevent that. It will stop people from photographing that barn. And 
Also that barn is a land, is I consider it a landmark of Yamhill County. It's been on our um, phone book, I, I believe. Um, it's been highly photographed by major photographers. I'm a photographer the, for the um, Oregon wine industry and I photograph for the Oregon wine um, um, board. Um, and I know that that is a very significant landmark for this area. I know that I'm sure you've all driven out to West Side Road and know the Red Barn. I mean, it's significant to our community. And then we're going to put this huge tower next to it where you cannot hide the visibility of that tower. There's not enough trees. And from a photography standpoint, I can tell you that there's no way that that's not going to be hidden. Um, and so I feel like if you know, we've got this beautiful landmark, which I'm sure the Bernards don't want it to be a landmark, but it, it you know, some things just become, you know, part of our co our community and part of our um, area. And it's significant um, to anybody. I mean, when I lived there for 13 years, when I say to people, well, you just go over the bridge past the red barn, everybody knows that's mm -hmm. what you do. And so it is very significant to our community. So I would like for you to th consider that as well, um, that, it's it it's taking away something that is really kind of cherished for that area. Um, then it also, the safety of it is a big concern. Um, it's you know that's right in that curve. And I would love to have maybe you guys weigh in with um, ODOT or one of the other. I mean I've been I have I have been I was one of the ones that actually was able to get them to do the new um, the um, solar speed control right there. I was the one that also was able to get the um, watch out for deer. We have a huge deer population. There's so much deer right in that location that actually are right around the barn. So there's a lot of deer activity there. Um, I was able to get the signing up for that. Um, and it's just mainly is that it's just not a safe area. It's not a safe area for, for trucks and stuff to be coming in and out of. And then also you've got all that logging trucks that are coming and it's right at the bend. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. if it was possibly in a different location on their property, if they went around on the backside, you would not have that significant. I wouldn't, I would assume you wouldn't have as much of significance of, of traffic. Um, but that's basically what I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ken, is this a new access off of West Side or is it at the Red Barn? at the existing, okay, farther towards McMinnville off of West Side. Okay. Um, okay, I would like to call for any further testimony in opposition to the application. And if, again, if you're online, please raise your hand. Oh, sure. Come on. Um, the other thing that I have. We, we have to have you on the microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, Anyways, that just might be a consideration that. Can you state your name? Oh, Lynn Norris. Um, and yeah, Gary's wife. So <laughs> um, anyway, just one other thing to consider that as a a community that now is attracting a lot of tourism, gets a lot of their money from tourism dollars, is that um, this is like one of the most beautiful entrances into the city. And I know in the paper, there's always talk about, oh, we want to improve this entrance and this entrance and make it nice and, you know, keep the, I guess, you know, the beauty of our community in McMinnville and, you know, tourists coming in. And honestly, this is an eyesore on one of the most beautiful entrances into the city. And, you know, if Bernard's and um, ACOM would consider at least putting back, you know, a quarter of a mile, if you look up on the hill, there's an access road a quarter of a mile up, you know, if there's huge trees back there, um, you know, we're gonna, they're taking out a section of the farmland to do this as it is. They, they've killed off active farmland to put this in. They could put it in you know, another small area of the farmland up behind some trees that wouldn't be right on the highway, right on the entrance to the city. So, I mean, maybe consider just the fact that 
you know, for the beauty of the entrance in the city, um, it's really going to be a bad, ugly eyesore. So, and, and it's going to be lighted 24 hours a day. So for us, you know, we're right across from it. That's going to be, and I know they say, well, we're going to mitigate it by shining it downward, but it's going to be lit 24 hours a day right across from us, basically in our front yard. So, and I know, you know, and I know this isn't a factor, but any of you sitting here going, oh, I'm going to have this eyesore literally in my front yard lit 24 hours a day um, because it's only a 150 yards from our front door. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. So if there are, is not any more testimony in opposition of application, I will call for the public agency reports and then, and then we will get to the rebuttal. There are no public agency reports. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now we are at the rebuttal by the applicant. Thank you, commissioners. Again, for the record, Mike Connors here on behalf of the applicant. Um, I certainly understand the sentiment of the neighbors. Uh, this is a pretty common theme for these kind of applications because uh, uh, they're hard. Uh, it's a, I think we all agree, it's a necessary infrastructure. I think in today's day and age, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't rely on wireless communication, either for phone, uh, you know, emails, text, et cetera. And there's really no way to provide those services, you know, you know, without having some kind of towers and facility because it's all about getting the right height and having the, the equipment to do it. And so one of the challenges that we always have is that everybody always says, okay, we know we need it and we rely on it, but we don't like it here, put it somewhere else. Uh, and it used to be in the beginning days of, of the creation of this network, somewhere else, there was a somewhere else that nobody really saw or was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But we're beyond those uh, days. And so now what we're doing is doing a lot of infill uh, kind of facilities. Uh, because as I indicated before, you know, there's th this is both a coverage and capacity issue. And what I mean by that is coverage is something that we all kind of understand, and that is that coverage like oh okay in this location there's a dark spot so you put a tower here to kind of cover that the capacity end of it is is that the amount of you know these these facilities can only handle so much data and so they become overburdened over time and so you need to have new facilities in place that will offload some of that burden so you can avoid having drop calls lack of service etc um, and so what you end up getting, the long and short of it is, is that a lot of these new facilities are having to be located in areas where there are other residents. Um, like I indicated early on, part of the target area here is the city of McMinnville, but their zoning prohibits this and anything but industrial, and there's no industrial properties. Um, and so if it was easy to just say, oh, okay, this is going to be an ice or we'll go somewhere else, uh, you know, I'm sure my clients would do that, but we're, we're kind of beyond those days where, where, where that's really an easy thing to do. And I just kind of wanted to say that generally, because again, I want to acknowledge, I understand where the neighbors are coming from. Uh, and if there was a way to say, well, let's just put it somewhere else and there's not going to be somebody that's going to be upset. Uh, that's really difficult to find. Um, and so again, on this particular site, um, you know, it was a, after a year and a half long process of trying to find other locations. This was not the site that we drove up, said, hey, this is ideal, let's do it here. We had to go through this extensive process and through the process of elimination uh, landed here. Um, and contrary to what Mr. Norris characterized as a very arbitrated half-baked sort of decision on where we located, that's not true. Um, you know, with a property owner, a property owner that's going to lease space, they have to be obviously part of that conversation to say, this is where I'm, I'm willing to lease. But in this case, with a farmer, uh, you know, active farm operation, this was the location that they determined would have the least impact on, on their uh, farming operation. And, and that's important because, again, 
I understand that people like to talk about issues and not what the standards are, but as you know, you know, that the county is subject to the standards and land use. And there is a specific standard that says we have to mitigate impacts on a farm operation. This particular, uh, this particular uh, proposed site does that for the reasons that I indicated before. It is not currently being actively farmed. Um, it is in close proximity to the access road. And I did want to clarify one thing. This is not a new access drive. Our access drive will come off the existing access drive. Um, but nonetheless, those kind of things are going to mitigate the impacts. A lot of what the neighbors are talking about is relocating it somewhere else for purposes that I don't think are relevant under the standards. And so that's part of the issue that you have to deal with is that there is a specific standard that requires that we minimize impacts on the farming operation. That's the location that we chose uh, in part based on that. And you know, the record will be open. We're, we're, we're willing to talk to the property owner. We're willing to, to talk to the neighbors, but we can't be in a position where we're relocating it to an area that's gonna have greater impacts on that farm operation. Because I'll tell you what will happen. If we relocate it somewhere else, it's going to be closer to somebody else's property and that somebody else is going to say, I object to that. And then suddenly we're in a position of a new, a new site and, a, and somebody objecting to it because now it impacts them greater and then a real standard that creates a problem for justifying that site. So that's one of the challenges that, that we have. And I just kind of want to let you know that up ahead. Again, uh, we will absolutely talk to the property owner. We'll, we'll talk to the neighbors and see, are there other locations on the subject property that may be able to minimize the impacts on the farming operation that the property owner would be amenable to that wouldn't require an extensive access road and that would still meet our coverage needs? Um, then, you know, that's something that, that we'd be open to. Um, it's not a cost issue. Uh, I just want to clarify, it's, it's, this, is, this is not an issue of us saying we want it to be here because of cost. That's not the driver. Um, and so this idea of getting all these detailed studies and all that, I think is really more than just delay the project than it is to really inform you on that, because that's not what we're saying is the basis for this. Nor is this a profit center. Um, I understand why people bring that up a lot. Verizon's a big, very, very profitable company, national company. But these towers are not where they make their money. Uh, the money is made in the services that they provide. And again, the services that they provide are not just purely for their profit. They're what I call national infrastructure. We all rely on that. We, we rely on that for emergency 911 to make sure we have adequate coverage to do that. So that's, so that, that, that's not what's driving this. What's driving this is, uh, and, and as you've got one comment in, there's, there's a very significant coverage and capacity issue in this area, and we're trying to, trying to um, serve that, serve that uh, efficiency so that the uh, folks in the neighborhood uh, can get reliable coverage. Um, I also just wanted to note that in terms of the use of the access road, uh, we're talking once a month at the most. There will not be a lot of trucks coming in and out of there. It's just it's just sort of routine, and it's once a month at the most kind of service that will be required. So, if you compare that to the traffic on that road from other you know uses, which are multiple times on a daily basis, this will be uh, a drop in the bucket of the traffic um, that is out there. And uh, um, so, with that. Um, like I indicated, we'll use this time period. Um, I understand that uh, there's this question of whether it's a week or two. We're, we're okay with two weeks if that's what's necessary. I would ask in addition to that, and this is a statutory right, and Mr. Friday can confirm this, under the statute of a party asked that the record be open, there's also an opportunity to uh, for all parties to submit uh, rebuttal or response uh, information because we all submit something and then you know, we're each looking at what each other submitted. You get an opportunity to say, well, actually, I disagree with that statement, et cetera. And then uh, by right under the statute, the applicant, the applicant alone gets an opportunity to submit a closing argument. And the reason why it's only the applicant that gets to do that is the applicant has the burden of proof. 
we're required to demonstrate compliance with the criteria. So that's what the statute provides. So that's what I would ask for, uh, which is all part of that statutory right that Mr. Norris triggered by asking that the record be left open. Um, so I would propose uh, two weeks for initial evidence that all parties can submit, one week for rebuttal evidence that all parties can submit, and then one week after that uh, for a closing argument that we would submit. Um, and so that would uh, be my suggestion on that post record process. And I'm prepared to read uh, what could be a motion uh, that would uh, mirror what he just has asked for. Thank you for putting that together. <laughs> I always struggle to do that. Um, I do have a quick question though. Um, can you just touch on the lighting issue? The lighting issue, yeah. Lighting. So we were just looking at that. Okay. It, it doesn't reflect. Yeah. We were almost sure that was the case. I always am afraid to say something if I am not 100% sure, but yeah, we can confirm. There's no lighting on this tower. Lighting on some towers is necessary, but it's all driven by FAA. If it's in the proximity of an airport that triggers at a certain height that there be some lighting, that's when these towers are required to be lit so that an aircraft that may be coming down in approach or, or, or in an ascent will be able to see the tower clearly. Um, this one doesn't require that, so there's not going to be 24 hour or any lighting on the on the tower. Uh, um, so hopefully that clears up okay. that particular on the tower or on the facilities down below. I mean, there'll be some lighting on the facilities down below, but that's more just for maintenance purposes. But that'll be on 24 hours. I don't believe so. No, just I think it's just on when correct. you come and correct. Okay. Yes. So of the facilities. Okay. So I'm happy to answer any other questions that you may have. I guess I'm just, you know, I'm looking at this property. Uh, there is significant non farmland On to the road. west down the access road. Um, what I would love to see is, you know, you're citing a tower by the red barn with a uh, suggested impact zone, right? Mm -hmm. You have a target of where you want to go. I would love to see how that changes if the tower moves west mm -hmm. in terms of who you're looking to service. Maybe it doesn't, but I, I would like to see that comparison. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, and, and uh, um, Chair Burchow, that's that's a really good question because just kind of get an idea there's multiple factors in relocating the tower one is the property owner's willingness to do it the second is what kind of utility or access would be required for for a, a different uh facility and then the third big one is will it will uh, that new site actually serve the coverage and capacity objectives that this is designed to do so those will be all of the factors that we'll be weighing as we look at, at, at you know, are there other alternatives that we can consider and report back to you um, through our comments. Yeah, and, and if they don't want it over there, that's one thing. But I guess I'm disappointed to hear that there hasn't been more proactive conversation between the Bernards and the families that very clearly will be impacted by this because there aren't a lot of trees around that red barn. I drive by it almost every day and it absolutely will impact them. And it's, it's a pretty bold thing to do on your property without um, proactively talking to your neighbors about what you're going to do. I think that they probably saw this coming. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise that neighbors are upset. So I would love to see some more indication that the Bernards are willing to come to the table and have discussions. Okay. I, I don't speak for them, but we will definitely engage with them and uh, relay those comments. And the thing you might want to also take back to them is we've had some, some successes in doing that here in this room where people were really, it was a lot of hostility and they agreed to kind of sit down and hug it out and they did and, and it, and it worked. So I, I think there's a lot of merit in that. We always do, you know, ready, fire, aim. And we never really just sit down and go, hey, is there a way we can address our concerns? It gets to be we lawyer up and then we yeah. go from there. So I, I think that would be it would be would go a long way. Well, well Commissioner Starr, I'm I'm glad you raised that. Um, that's kind of my style. You know, I know lawyers are viewed as adversarial and going into combat. And that's not why I got into law. I'm a hugger. 
if I can find a solution that everybody can get on board with and, and facilitate that, then I, I'm all for that. Um, it's just only gets difficult when you don't have that option. And then you're kind of left with the resort of having to just advocate your various positions. But I hear what you're saying. And I, I agree that that's always the best resolution. If it's something that can happen, then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. And if not, we'll at least be able to explain better to you uh, why that is. Yeah. Uh, but it's worth that effort. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what I'm hearing is keep the record open for 30 days, correct? Two weeks. Weeks, two, I two, three weeks. two weeks, a week, a week, and then we come back uh, okay. a week later. Okay. Uh, so the motion that uh, you could consider is the record shall be open till 5 p.m. on May 23rd, 2024 uh, for all parties to submit written testimony or evidence to the planning department at 400 Northeast Baker Street, McMinnville. The record shall then be open until 5 p.m. on May 30th, 2024 for all parties to submit to the planning department written rebuttal to what was submitted during the first open record period. The record shall then be open for the applicant only to submit final written argument with no new evidence until 5 p.m. on June 6, 2024. And at that point, the record shall be closed. The board of commissioners shall then reopen the hearing at 10 a.m. on June 13th, 2024 in room 32 of the Amhill County Courthouse at the point of staff recommendation. So moved. That is a month. Yep. Wow. Thank you. I have a few things to add. So on top of echoing what both commissioners have already commented, uh, the other thing is um, you're going to lose it. If you can get it back into that barnyard, and I'm looking at just a narrow image, so I don't know topography, if you're going to end up in a hole or whatever. <laughs> but somewhere in that barnyard, I would think you'd be able to stay almost on uh, maybe same elevation as you would be on this chosen spot out by the highway. Um, if you were, you're going to lose a whole entrance on what I agree is a very dangerous highway. Um, um, on top of it being very frustrating that, and, and I, I understand the whole process, but we haven't engaged with the neighbors yet to try to resolve this. And yet we're here coming up with a resolution of, hey, let's go engage with the neighbors to see if we can resolve this. So hopefully in the next two weeks, we can come up with something, but those are my concerns. Okay. I pr appreciate you communicating and uh, kind of giving us direction. That's always helpful. So that I'm not trying to interpret for my client what you guys yeah. are thinking. So uh, that's appreciated and uh, we'll, we'll look into it and we'll report back. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So we need to vote, right? <clears throat> Jody? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, I moved, I made the motion. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Great. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate yep. your time. Thank you, guys. Oops. Now that we're back in formal session. Yeah, I'm going to bring us back in. Yeah, okay. um, I just kind of wanted to, um, just a quick update. For for whatever reason, we're, we're still trying to diagnose, but our live feed to YouTube dropped oh. 43 seconds into the meeting. Oh, no. And it didn't come to our attention until we were into the hearing, but the Zoom seemed to be functioning just fine. Excuse us, we're still in session. Excuse me. Sure. Excuse me. We're still in session. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. So, um, so our our uh, so we lost our YouTube feed, and I didn't want to interrupt the hearing just to correct that because we were still streaming everything just fine on Zoom, and so and both were noticed. So, I just want to we'll find out what's going on with our our. Um, zoom to youtube feed but this is it's come up a couple times now we can still post it though to youtube yeah we'll later. post a recording yeah. of the zoom meeting yeah. okay so i guess we're in 
announcements. Uh, we had a House Bill 4002 meeting yesterday morning um, with the whole crew, um, Sheriff, DA, uh, HHS director, and then chiefs of police and, and members of our police departments. I think we're we're sort of narrowing it down and getting closer to how we will implement um, our version of a deflection program. And it looks like our pie, our part of the pie for funding is roughly about $485,000. So that could go up if, if various factors are at play, but um, the grant application for that money is coming up here pretty soon. It opens pretty soon and it's due July 1st. So uh, Ken submitted, I think a couple weeks now, our intent to apply for the money. Um, so at some point here really soon, um, probably in the next, gosh, what is today? Probably by the end of this month, we're gonna have to have the work group put together the formal proposal with job descriptions and sort of the whole plan on how we're gonna implement this it will have to come before the board so that we can discuss it and approve the grant application and then we're gonna have to get it done and submit it. And so what it's on a high level, what it's looking like is we will have HHS sort of do the function that they already do when it comes to, you know, peer to peer addiction related services, detox, all of those functions that they already do and sort of utilize that um, and then have someone either a new position, if you will, if under the sheriff's department or CJC, or maybe some combination of that to be the interface between law enforcement, because law enforcement is going to be out there citing folks again for possession. And it's all of that data has to be put into a system and someone has to track it so that there can then be connections to HHS and we can track for accountability. The accountability piece of this is the key mm -hmm. in my mind. So um, potentially a new position in in either one of those um, departments. And then, you know, Brad is still gonna have to measure the impact on his department, whether or not we have a bunch of new, you know, PCS cases and and he's going to need another deputy DA to, to handle all that or not. We don't really know. Like there's a lot of unknowns at this point still, but we're we're trying to at least set up the structure so that come September 1st, we can hopefully turn it on and and be as prepared as we possibly can be. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So but just to clarify, um, because that was a uh, in a an amendment that Brad had already made to his budget. He put in a placeholder and added a DDA in his proposed budget that was yep. approved last week. Yeah. In, specific. in the work group, I mean, I, I, we've been talking about, I think you're going to need another DDA, but in the work group, we've also, he's been looking at the back end management of the records and stuff. So I think we're, we've come to the conclusion that with that position, we still need some type of person that is organizing records outside of that. So um, so it's coming together. I just am really thankful for, for all of these, these guys coming together on, you know, on shift and right out at the beginning of their day and spending now, gosh, I think we've had four or five meetings. So all the time they're putting into it, it's just been really, really great to see all the sounds coordination. Like, sounds like you guys ran it through a very thorough process. Yeah. Yeah. And learned a lot, frankly, about how, you know, each department works. So. Um, obviously last week, uh, and, and has been in the news, our County treasurer resigned. Um, there's been a lot of questions. Oh, and I wish, I wish Christian was here because I asked him to sort of walk through that. And I don't know if you can, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, um, we, there's been a lot of questions about what happens next. Is there going, does it necessitate a special election? What's the process? So I don't know if we can speak to that. I do not know. I don't know if okay. The gist is basically that um, Mike Barnhart is the official deputy treasurer. Mm -hmm. um, he's already been given that title. So he will step in um, immediately and take over and run the function of that 
um, that office. I think there's a lot of misconception out there that the treasurer is in charge of all of the county's finances and all of the ins and outs of the day to day. And that's not true. It's, it's really more of an investment, um, like managing an investment portfolio role. So uh, he's going to step in and take over. I don't believe it necessitates a special election. I think that um, the anyone who wants to run for treasurer can file by August, August once uh, Mrs. Bledsoe removes her name from the ballot. But that's not a foregone conclusion because um, Ms. Bledsoe can keep her name on the ballot and would have to withdraw it at the same time. Uh, it's a separate action. Would have mm -hmm. to do it at that same August deadline that someone would have to file. So we don't know what that's going to look like other than, uh, it, I, I was told by Christian, it won't necessitate a special election. And it says, the statute says the board shall appoint a replacement treasurer, but he says it doesn't say when. So we don't have a hard and fast date to do that, nor do we have to right now since we have an acting and a deputy. Deputy, treasurer. yeah. Correct, it says shall appoint, but there's no timelines associated with that. And this is, we have a deputy treasurer who's currently yeah. covering the, the duties and responsibilities for the vacant office right now. Yep, and I have full faith in Mike. Absolutely, okay. it's been wonderful. Yep. So I think there's consensus that Mike will continue to be the role of operate in that role. Yeah, um, Mike, Mike would serve, you know, that doesn't require any action by okay. default as being the deputy treasurer. He'll continue until someone's appointed or elected and takes office. Okay. And the, I believe it, does, it wouldn't be a special election. The office of the treasurer has to be filled either by appointment or in a general election. General, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. I just want to make sure that we're, we had an update so the public's clear on, on where we're at on that. Other than that, um, I wanted to wish all of our moms happy Mother's Day this weekend. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Day. Yep. Just want to um, call out that our clerk, and staff and election workers have been busy processing yep. ballots. We went over and Commissioner Johnston and I got to see a demonstration. It's they're statutorily required to run a test ballot and everything checks out. She did a great job. Also, we spent the day on Tuesday over at the Office of Emergency Management with a countywide uh, tabletop exercise and a staff from all the departments were there. So we really got to hear where some of our shortfalls were in terms of being able to address critical county functions in the event that internet was down or that there was a significant um, uh, weather event or something like that. So we'll be uh, looking at some of where those, those holes could be plugged. Uh, also on Saturday, we're going to be a number of community partners. We're gonna be honoring our foster parents and their kids and just acknowledging the fact that these are special families and we appreciate the resource parents who step up uh, to be a safe place for these kids. So it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a good event. Happy Mother's Day. Okay. If there's nothing else for the good of the order, I will adjourn the Yamhill County formal session for May 9th, 2024. It is 11.54. Thank you. Look at you.